you would open up your Bibles with me this evening to the book of Acts, chapter 16. Uh, we'll be reading there in a moment. Uh, John Patton was a missionary in the New Hebrides Islands. I'm not 100% sure if I read that correctly, but um, if you know the correct pronunciation, you can tell me after service. Uh, one night, hostile natives surrounded the mission station, intent on burning out the patents and killing them. And you guys think outreach is hard. <laughs> Patton and his wife prayed during that terror-filled night that God would deliver them. When daylight came, they were amazed to see their attackers leave. One year later... Uh, the chief of the tribe was converted to Christ. Remembering what had happened, Patton asked the chief what had kept them from burning down the house and killing them. And the chief replied in surprise, Who were all those men with you there? And Patton knew that no men were present, but the chief said that he was afraid to attack because he had seen hundreds of big men in shining garments with drawn swords circling the mission station. This story is true. God does things like this. Many people deny its reality, but you hear too many of them to question the reality of the supernatural protection that can come from God. And we find ourselves in life many times trapped, and we see, we see no way out. We see no option through our circumstances. But it is through the supernatural protection of God that we can find ourselves not only protected by the grace of God himself, but empowered and able to be delivered and set others around us free as well. So let's read our text this evening from the book of Acts, chapter 16, uh, verses 22 through 26. It says, The crowd joined in attacking them, them being Paul and Silas, and the magistrates tore the garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had f inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. And, it, and I'm not talking about safely like, oh, here's some bandages and a blanket and some cookies. We're talking about like, don't let these guys go. Having received this order, he put them into in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. At about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Let's pray this evening. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this message of hope, God, that we can. Uh, access God's supernatural protection and deliverance, God, by the power of your name, God, that your Holy Spirit, God, would help us in this place tonight, God, that you would minister to each and every one of us, Father, that no one would leave this place, God, untouched by your Spirit tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to read a small portion of that one more time, verses 22 through 24. Speaking of how they got into that situation, the crowd joined in attacking them. The magistrates tore their garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. This is Paul and Silas. And you might think, man, what did they do to deserve this? They must have beaten somebody up, stolen their stuff, rode off in their chariot. Grand Theft Chariot. But they were serving God. They were serving God to find themselves in this situation. They get ordered to be kept in the most secure fashion in the jail, in the inner depths of it, chained up, guarded by an armed soldier. And Paul and Silas find themselves in very real chains. This isn't figuratively speaking. They are being held back by actual physical chains being held back from doing their life's work and their mission. 
You see, life is full of various different chains from mental and spiritual and even a physical perspective. Chains that will hold us back from doing God's will for our life, from living a life of happiness and joy and peace or what have you. And there's various different things that you can think about that hold us back. And many of us at one point or another have been held back by chains in our life. And I don't mean literal chains, although that could have been possible. That's not usually much of a means of restraint these days unless you're being handcuffed. I guess that counts. But many people deal with mental chains, chains of addiction, chains of emotional issues and mental illness, chains of, a, of just a lack of confidence, or even spiritual issues, chains of false religion, or, or chains of having no religion at all. That's a whole other sermon in itself. And there can even be physical chains, but not literal chains. Things like lifestyle choices, ways that we have set our mind on living. A work or a career choice, or relationships that we choose to stay in, or relationships that we found ourselves stuck in. There are many different things that we can, be, that we can describe as a chain in our life, that we can describe as something that holds us back, that keeps us from living the life that God has for us. And the reality is, the chains that we find ourselves in, whether we want to be chained by them or not, some people love their chains, will always be an unruly and brutal master. The world is always looking to hold us down and keep us as slaves to the world, to itself, to its ways. But 1 Corinthians 7.23 says, You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. Listen, saved or not in this place tonight, Jesus paid the price for our freedom. Jesus paid the price so that the shackles can hit the floor. Jesus paid the price so that we can walk as free men and women despite the pain and suffering that we see in this world. But how do we do this? How do we find this freedom? How do we achieve this comfort? When we have these mental issues, these spiritual issues, or these circumstances in our lives that are holding us back. We can learn a lot from what Paul and Silas did when they were in literal chains. We just have to praise him, even from our chains. This is how we unlock the chains, freedom from the chains in our lives. Acts 16, 25 through 26, I'll read it again. It says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. You see, Paul and Silas found themselves in chains. They could have easily said, we don't deserve to be here. This isn't right. This is wrong. It was Late, it says about midnight. I don't know about y'all, but when it's about midnight, I'd rather be asleep in my bed. It's dark, it's cold, and miserable. You think, you know, in prisons these days, even, you know, even prison, they still have air conditioning and stuff. At least I think. I mean, I'm sure there's some that probably don't, but this one definitely didn't. I'll tell you what, Benjamin Franklin wasn't around yet. They didn't have AC. They haven't invented electricity. It was cold. It was dark. And it was miserable. And they were surrounded by other prisoners. You see, from our perspective, we can look at Paul and Silas without knowing how the story ends. We all know how the story ends. I've already blown it. But if we don't know how the story ends, we can look at their situation and we can think, man, that sucks. They have every right to be mad. They have every right to be angry. They have every right to be stomping their feet and even angry with God. God, we got here by serving you. This isn't right. They could have been bumming, and nobody would have blamed them. 
They could have gone around to every other prisoner in that place complaining and looking for sympathy. Hey, man, listen, you might have stole from so-and-so, but I got here serving God. But when we ourselves in our lives find ourselves in these hypothetical chains in our lives, do we justify our whining and our moping by our bad circumstances? When things aren't going right, when we think that we deserve better, do we justify our bad attitudes and our whining by how badly things are going for us? Woe is me, and I'm going to make sure everyone knows it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm, I'm guilty. But instead, what did they do? They praised God during their captivity. They had just been, not, they weren't even in, just in jail. They had just gotten their butts whooped by a crowd of angry people. They were beaten and bruised for no fair reason. And now thrown in jail in verse 25, what does it say they're doing? They were praying and singing hymns to God. When we're in our trials, are we getting angry with God? Are we blaming God for our circumstances? Or do we find it within us to praise God from our shackles and give Him glory even when it's hard, even when it seems difficult, even when if we're being honest, it doesn't seem like God deserves it? I mean, you're wrong, but you know, sometimes you feel that way. <laughs> you know, there's one man in the Bible who knows a thing or two about being faithful to God through difficult times. His name was Job. And Job's story is documented in the book of Job. Fitting name, isn't it? And it starts off like this in Job chapter 1, the first chapter and the first three verses, says this, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. So in other words... Job had it made in the shade. Job was rich. And if you guys don't understand, I talked about it a little bit this morning too. When you have that many animals, many of us think about, man, that's a lot of poop to clean up. But when you're talking about Bible times, when you're talking about Old Testament riches, this dude's loaded. Animals are converted into currency, essentially. He has not only enough, but more than enough. He's got as many camels as he could ever dream of to ride on. Yoke to plow the uh, yoke of oxen to plow the field. All of it. A beautiful family. And it says, He is the greatest of all the people of the East. But when you read Job's story, you think, man, this guy's got it good. But it doesn't take long for that to change. You see, this is just the first three verses of the first chapter. But by the end of the first chapter, Job's children are all dead. All of his property is gone. And not long into chapter 2, we find Job himself covered in boils and sores, living in as the animals and scraping, the Bible describes it as scraping his sores with broken clay. And at this point, all he has left is his wife. And I've heard men say, man, if all I've got is my wife, I'll be all right. But let me tell you, it didn't, it was, that's not how it went for him. You see, she wasn't exactly much of a support for him at this point. Job chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 documents his, an encounter with his wife. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. That's his wife's advice. 
But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. You see, you read through the story of Job, and it's revealed that Job wasn't maybe as good as he thought he was. He wasn't perfect. But no matter how bad things got, no matter how much people told him, hey man, you should just give in and die, curse God and die, the one thing that he held true to is that God knows what he's doing and I'm going to be faithful to that. I don't understand why I'm going through this, but God has a plan and he's a little bit smarter than me. And if you are familiar with the story of Job, you know that his story has a triumphant end. Job 42, the last chapter of Job, verse 10 says, And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. His health is restored his livestock is restored, and then some. God gives him children once again, and it says he basically lived happily ever after. It's not the exact words of the Bible, but that's pretty much what it says. You know, I have to wonder, though, how would have Job's story have ended, or would it even be in the Bible, if in chapter 2 he took his wife's advice and cursed God and died? You see, church, the advice of Job's wife is the advice of the world. When we find ourselves in struggles, and it's probably not as bad as Job had it, no matter how bad you might think your day went, the world will tell us, just curse God and die. Just forget that whole Jesus thing and live your life the way you want to live your life. It's clearly not working out for you. And you have to think, when Paul and Silas got thrown into prison, beaten and bruised, their clothes were torn from their bodies, they probably didn't look so hot when they made it into prison. And the other prisoners probably, you know, you know prison talk. You all have been there, right? No, maybe not. But you see it in the movies. What are you in for? You know, Paul and Silas explained, well, you know, we were out ministering the love of Jesus Christ and we cast a demon out from this girl and her slave owners got mad at us, beat us up and threw us in jail. That is what happened. And then the prisoners are listening to this thinking, wait, you guys didn't like Grand Theft Chariot? You guys didn't launder some shekels? What, like, you're in here for serving God? Man, what kind of God do you have? This was probably the advice of their fellow, ser- uh, fellow jailmates in prison. They probably said, man, you guys are in, in the wrong gig. You guys are following the wrong God. What kind of God is going to let you go through that? You might as well curse God and die here in this jail. You see, this is what the world will tell us. The world will tell us the cost to serve God is just too high. But Jesus will tell us the cost of serving the world will cost you everything. Mark 8, 34 through 38 says, And then calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whatever is ashamed of me, for whoever is ashamed of me, 
and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. Jesus is speaking of either saving your life on earth from an earthly perspective and having it cost you your eternity or giving your life on earth to Jesus, which some people might view as giving a lot up. Some people might view it as boring or dreadful. But what you gain is true life and eternal life in heaven. There is no trial here on earth as Job very well knew and as Paul and Silas very well knew. There is no trial on earth that is worth cursing God and costing us our eternity. Giving up on the ways of the Lord. Paul and Silas sing praises to God when they found themselves in a situation that they could have easily said, we don't deserve to be here. And they didn't. And what happens when they do this? They find freedom through the power of Christ. Acts 16, verse 26. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the earth were shaken, and immediately the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. You see, just like Job, as I mentioned before, I can't help but wonder what might have happened if Paul and Silas didn't praise God in this situation. If they took the advice of their fellow prisoners and said, you guys, what a joke. You're here because of your God. Just give up, man. This is pointless. I can't help but wonder what would have happened if at midnight, in that very same jail, they were cursing God. They were angry with their circumstances. They were bumming. You know, Paul went on to do quite a bit in his ministry. It could have stopped right there. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not a fortune teller. But their faithfulness to God, even when they found themselves in chains, was both freeing for them as well as a testimony to the people around them. If you find yourself stuck in life, bad situation after bad situation, you're feeling captive by the circumstances in your life, the solution is to sing praises to God from your chains and allow Him to shake things up. You see, in our text, it was Paul and Silas were singing praise, but they didn't make the earth quake. They didn't make the foundations of the prison shake. They didn't make the chains fall off of them. That was God. They were just faithful servants. Galatians 5.1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Christ has already set us free, and Paul and Silas knew that. There was no amount of actual chains that could be put on their arms and legs to actually bond them, to actually put them into slavery because they knew that they were set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. And just like them, we can't allow our earthly circumstances to convince us to return to a yoke of slavery, to return to the yoke of the world. And when we can find ourselves praising God from the chains... We don't only unlock freedom for ourselves, but we can also be a testimony and a witness to the people around us who are also in chains. When we praise God from our chains, we don't just find ourselves free. We find people around us finding freedom as well. When we praise God in our difficult times, in our difficult circumstances, it helps us, it benefits us, It's a good thing, but the people around us, they notice too. Think about it. Let's read verse 25 again. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. 
And the prisoners were listening to them. Now, what was going through the prisoners' minds? It doesn't say. They might have been like, shut up already. They might have been confused, you know, because they know where they are. They're right there with them. You guys are praising the same God that got you into this mess. They might have been amazed by their faithfulness. Like, you know what? You guys are, you're, you're impressive. I would, have, I would have cursed God and died in this place. But whatever was going through their mind, we don't know. But what the verse tells us is that the prisoners were listening to them. They had their attention. Listen, church, when you are praising God from the chains, no matter what people are telling you, whether it's encouraging or discouraging, you have their attention. They are listening to you, whether they're acting like it or not, whether they're acting like they care or not. They see you, and they see you in their circumstances, and they are paying attention. When we worship God in the depths of our valleys, in our most difficult moments, people will notice. And that's not why we do it. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We do it because God is worthy of it. But we also do what we do so that we can witness to lost souls and bring people to Jesus. And they might be confused. They might be impressed. They might be annoyed. They might even mock you. But they're listening. But in these circumstances, when we have their attention, we may or may not be winning them over. But it's what God does next. It's what God does. It's when God get in, gets involved in the situation. That is what really blows their mind. That is what really gets their attention. As we read, verse 26, There was a great earthquake, and the foundations of the prison were shaken Immediately the doors were open and everyone's bonds were fastened. Notice again, it says everyone's bonds were unfastened. Not just Paul and Silas. What happened to these prisoners in that moment? Were they, did they begin praising God? Did they just run for their lives? Well, we know they didn't run for their lives. We'll read that in a moment. But when God got involved in Paul and Silas' situation, it affected the people around them. Nobody knew what was going to happen. Nobody knew how it was going to happen. But when God moved, everyone felt it. When we praise God in our situations, it doesn't only affect us. It is contagious. And when God moves... People will see. They will see a faithful God who is faithful to a faithful servant. But also at the same time, the same thing can be said for when we are sour and angry towards God in these situations. The people around us will notice that too. But when we are faithful... And God delivers his people from their situations, from their circumstances. They will also begin to see their need for saving, even when they didn't even realize they were in chains. You see, the story goes on uh, when, Paul, uh, when God delivers Paul and Silas. Something amazing happens afterwards. Picking up the story in verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately the doors were opened, everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposed that, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. So in other words, he knew, man, I'm going to die for this, so I might as well do it myself. That's how they rolled back in the day. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. 
And when they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house, and he took them that same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all of his family. Then, uh, then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. You see, we see Paul and Silas in literal chains, in an actual prison. But the prisoners around them and the jailer himself were in spiritual bondage. They were in spiritual chains. And when the jailer saw that God delivered them from their situation, was when he realized that he was the one who was in chains. He was the one who was in bondage. He realized these men just went through what they went through, and their God moved in their circumstances, and they praised him through it all. I need what they have. You know, he could have said, you know what? Shut up. Put your chains back on. I'm, I got the sword. You don't. He didn't. He saw what God did, and he saw the faithfulness of Paul and Silas. And he saw that he needed what they had. When we are faithful and we praise God from our chains, in our imprisonment, through our troubles, we are unlocking a supernatural protection and deliverance that can only come from God. But we are also able to show the amazing and freeing power of Christ in our lives to the people around us who are the true captives who are the people who are actually needing to be set free. When we go through struggles, we can be a sign of hope to the people who are in spiritual chains, who are the ones who truly need to be set free by the love of Christ. Can we be that people when we go through the struggles, when we go through the hard times, can we be Paul and Silas to prisoners around us? Can I have every head bowed and every eyes closed this evening?